Hello and welcome to video 1.3 where we're going to be describing quantitative distributions. Vocab covered here are going to be the things that you actually are going to be thinking about to describe. Context, shape, you can see there are different shapes, outlier, center, spread, and resistant. Uh, no calculator maneuvers today because this video focuses in on just describing displays given to you using the new vocab and not so much about finding some of these actual metrics. But I will show you on the uh, formula sheet where you can see these formulas for them just in case you're uh, interested in it. So to get started, we're going to jump right into talking about this acronym I like to use to help me remember how to describe all the components of different distributions handed to me. I uh, say it as CSOX. Uh, it stands for context, shape, outliers, center, and spread. Now, I start with the context because it's important to get out and it makes your uh, description specific to your data. So you're gonna be describing using labels that you see in your histograms that you might be thrown at you um, to help you make your description specific. That's really important. So I usually start all of my descriptions with like the distribution of blank and that blank gets filled in with whatever the label I'm looking at here, blood pressure or price or number of siblings, things like that. The next component is the shape. That's the first thing we like to sort of talk about uh, after context. So what shape are you looking at? So shape can come in sort of two different flavors, okay? Uh, one of the things we like to talk about is how many modes does it have? Uh, you might have heard the word mode previously because it is something that you talk about maybe in like middle school. Mean, median, and mode kind of get sort of groups together, uh, which makes sense because that's, you know, kind of a way you can measure center. Uh, but we talk about modes more as sort of like humps in this particular case. So like how many humps or peaks does our particular distribution have? Um, so there are sort of just three buckets we like to throw it into that we'll usually see. This very first one we would say is unimodal. It just has that one peak we can see there on the left here. If we're sort of to trace over the distribution like this, we see just one little peak there. But if we were to do that with that middle distribution, we could see that it sort of dips down in the middle, giving us two humps. So we would call that bimodal. And it's possible that you have a distribution that has more than two peaks, trimodal, but you know, those don't pop up too much. I would probably throw those into a, a, just a special bucket I'd call multimodal. Now what happens if you have something sort of like what's on the right here, where there are any like necessary dips or peaks, everything's just like kind of like at the same height. How do you describe that? I would say that this is roughly uniform. I put a squiggly because it's not perfectly uniform. Perfectly uniform would be literally all of those histogram bars are the exact same height. And that's not gonna usually happen if we're dealing with real life data. So what we all say is that it's roughly normal. So squiggly uh, uh, uniform, sorry, not normal, uniform. Um, but we want to make sure that we're uh, being accurate, that it's like, it's not perfectly uniform, it is just roughly uniform. The other way we can describe the shape is talking about sort of its symmetry. Is it symmetric, roughly, or is there something else going on here? So this middle one here is roughly symmetric. Actually, it's perfectly symmetric because it's a perfect model, but I will write the roughly because Again, real life data will never be perfectly symmetric. Uh, so we do that little squiggly beforehand to sort of signify that. But the other ones are what we would call skewed. Uh, and we want to attach a direction to it. And sometimes it can be a little confusing as to how do you know which way it's skewed. Uh, I'll just go ahead and jump in. This one over here on the left is actually skewed left. How do I know that? The skew is actually in the direction of the tail. So this tail that we're sort of seeing right here, that tells me the direction of the skew. Um, it also has to do with some other things going on there, but that's what I pay attention to. Where's the tail? Oftentimes we sort of make the mistake and pay attention to like, where's the hump at? That's not what we're supposed to pay attention to in our description here. So that means that the one over here on the right is skewed right. because 
that tail is on the right, as we can see. And I just sort of slammed down that note again. You want to use the word approximately or the little squiggly, that's totally okay. Anytime dealing with something symmetric or uniform, because you won't have things that are perfectly uniform or perfectly symmetric. The last little nugget on this front side here is about outliers. I think a lot of us know what outliers are, so I won't go too much into it, but outliers are things that deviate sort of from the overall pattern. There are criteria for determining outliers um, that we'll get into in a future video. For now, you're just using your best judgment. So if you wanted to, you can even cover your butt by saying there appears to be an outlier at blah just so that way you're not actually like saying definitively, since right now we're just using best judgment. So here we are on the back side where we're gonna now talk about center. So center is sort of a, a single number we try to slap down on a distribution that kind of describes the quote unquote typical value of the distribution. It's a little bit vague kind of on purpose because there are a couple different ways you could describe it. One of the most common ways is a mean. So a mean is the arithmetic average, okay? That's the one where you add up all the data points, divide by the number of things, and you get that value. Um, and so we talk about a sample mean uh, and versus a population mean, a true population mean. And there's different notation for those things. Uh, a sample mean is noted with an X bar. So that bar over the X um, kind of is uh, something you'll notice that kind of pops up when we're dealing with, you know, samples. There's things on tops of, of our, our sort of letters. So X bar is how we say that one. For a true population, we denote it with a Greek letter mu, mu. Uh, which is sort of like a lowercase m in this particular case, which kind of makes sense. If it's a mean, you know, works out for you. Um, so mean, uh, the formula for the mean, as I said, and I just described it for you there in words, it does show up on your formula sheet. If you wanted to pause and get that out, you can see, but uh, I will just sort of label it right here. You can see that they use the X bar symbol there, and that's how you calculate it is. You're going to, and this little uh, like E looking thing is actually a sigma, which stands for sum. So it's saying, add up all of your X's, all your X sub I's, all your data points, and divide by the number of things. There's just a couple of ways you could write it there. So the good thing is, is your calculator can calculate these sorts of things relatively quickly for you, so you don't really need to do it by hand. On the other way to measure a typical value is something called median, uh, and that would be the middle value of your distribution. So you kind of take all of your data values, you put them from least to greatest, and then you chop it in half. And that middle point there, that is your median. So 50% of your data lies below this value and 50% of your data lies above it. Um, if you have an even number though, so if it's an odd number, there is a middle number, but if you have an even number of values, you then take the mean of the two middle data points. So say if you had 10 data points, there'd be a bottom five and a, bo a, ha a top five. Your median actually would fall halfway between the uh, four, fifth and sixth number there. Median also has a symbol that we do not actually use a whole lot, but it's maybe a fun little nugget to kind of have in there, which is an X with a, a little tilde above it. Uh, I actually don't know how to say this out loud. X tilde, X squiggle, X, I don't know. That's how little we use it is that I don't know actually the proper way to say that out loud to somebody. Let's now move on to the another thing, spread. So spread is sort of describing how tightly the data is clustered around this measure of center. So how close are our data points to the mean or the median? And just like with center, there are more than one way to actually measure these things. The first and probably the one that will be most common to us later in the year is the standard deviation. The standard deviation is the average distance a value is from the mean. Um, we talk about standard deviation, and again, just like with mean in terms of a sample 
or a whole population of people or things. So there's different notation for those. If it's a sample standard deviation, we stick with sort of our normal alphabet we use in the English language. It is just an S standing for, of course, standard deviation. But later on, we'll talk about populations a lot. And when we talk about the standard deviation for a population, we use a lowercase sigma. And that is a Greek letter that stands for an S. So it kind of matches up there. So you kind of notice a, a, um, a trend. If we're talking about a population, we use that Greek alphabet. If we're talking about a, uh, just a sample, we're gonna use that you know, normal alphabet we're used to in our English language. And the formula sheet also has standard deviation on it right here. This is standard deviation. Um, and that formula is a little bit more complicated than thinking about mean. Um, it's something that we will kind of talk about in class. But again, like with mean, you don't need to calculate it by hand. Your calculator can do it for you. But it is kind of cool to like look at and pay attention to and kind of make sense of. But there's other ways to measure, particularly our interquartile range is another way to measure the spread. So the quartiles are sort of your 25% chunks, okay? You technically have, you know, four quartiles or five quartiles, I guess, technically. Um, but the, the first quartile is the 25th percent chunk. So that's sort of like the, the middle of your lower half. Remember my example of saying 10 data points? So you got your five lower and your five up above. So now from those, you could split that in half and find the middle point, and that would be your, your quartiles, your first quartile in the lower part, and then your third quartile in the upper part. And we call that the IQR. So that's just a shorthand way of sort of doing that. So that's one way to sort of measure these things as well. Range is the last one. It's actually kind of also the last one you want to use. The standard deviation is really nice to use. There's gonna be some great reasons why in the future. Interquartile range is sort of like a, oh, I'll use that if I have to. Range you only really want to use if that's really the only thing you can tell about it. And that is just simply the difference between your maximum and your minimum. So if your data goes from you know, 40 to 100, then your range will be 100 minus 40, which equals 60. So we'll talk about sort of when to use these things as we sort of go along here, which brings me to our last little bit. So a great question you can ask is, well, how do I know whether to use mean or median? How do I know if I should be using standard deviation or interquartile range, or do I have to go to range? Um, and that has to do with sort of how you describe your, your shape. That is the sort of the key here and your outliers. So let's kind of look at these different distributions. Take a quick moment and just describe the shape in terms of modes and in terms of symmetry. And then note if there's any sort of outliers going on for each one. So I've just wrote down all of them. Hopefully you said the same things I have here. First one skewed right. Next one, about symmetric. Outliers in that third one. And then bimodal distribution for that last one there. So let's talk about center first here. So what would we use mean for? Here's the thing. Mean is a non-resistant sort of uh, measure of center, okay? What that means is, Anything in the, uh, the distribution strays from roughly symmetric heavily affects the mean. So because of that, we don't want to use the mean for anything other than things that are roughly symmetric with no outliers. So I would use mean only for that one about the east hallway length measurement. That's the only one I think of these four would be a good one. Well, of the, the first three. Bimodal, we'll kind of get into a little bit. So what's the backup plan? If something is skewed, then we go median. Or, hey, it's still kind of roughly symmetric, but I got some outliers. Stick with the median because median are, the median is a resistant measure. So I'm gonna scroll back up here really quickly and right next to it, resistant measure. Median is a resistant measure. So outliers and skew 
don't really mess with it too much. Um, it kind of still stays uh, roughly around the center because it's just the 50th uh, percentile. It's just that middle point. Mean is a calculation. So all of these values that are very far to the right or left, when you add them up, pull it. So in this case, this skew, the mean is getting pulled towards that direction to the upper level, which, you know, if you were to calculate it out, you'd find out like maybe like four pets seems to be the mean. That's not a good measure of a typical number of pets looking at this. Same thing over here. These outliers pull that mean over to the right for number of siblings. So you might find out again, like it's like four siblings is the common one. No, like we can see that that's not true. You could actually calculate those out if you'd like, but I'm just giving you as an example that the means start to be sort of deceptive as a typical value for center. Same thing with spread. Mean and standard deviation are both calculatory sort of measures, and because of that, we pair them together. So mean, anytime I use mean, I'm also gonna use standard deviation, which is only in things that are roughly symmetric with no outliers. On the other hand, if I'm dealing with median, then I'm going IQR. So things that are skewed, I'm going IQR. Things that have heavy outliers, I'm going IQR. Because, just like with median, interquartile range is a resistant measure. Heavy outliers, you can think about it. Like if all we're looking at is that middle 50% of your data, then it doesn't matter if on the ends you have heavy outliers, the middle 50% is the middle 50%. So that's a reason why we'd wanna use IQR there. Range. Range is also something that's non-resistant. So when do we use it? Only for histograms. If you have only a histogram with no other information, the best you can really do is go, ah, the minimum kind of lies here, the maximum kind of lies there. So here, here's roughly my range. So range is really just the most backup plan. If you're just given a histogram, you just go, great, like I'll go with my range here. To finish off, okay, I want you to actually think about bimodal. It's an interesting animal to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I want you to have like a, a gut feeling and think about how to defend your gut feeling here. What would you do to try to describe a typical value in a bimodal distribution? And like, what do you think we'd be using to kind of measure spread? Should we go with standard deviation? Should we go with interquartile range? Should we go with range? Should we like just kind of not even go for any of those things and maybe try something different? I want you to brainstorm what you would do with a bimodal distribution to try to sort of come up with a way to describe it. And then we'll share our ideas when we get into class.